Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I was thinking about, like, what's the whole meaning of Christmas? When you think about God, you think about a He's a mysterious God, yet He constantly unveils a little bit more and more of Him every single time that we draw closer to Him. You begin to learn a little bit more about Him. And, uh, and then I also started thinking about Christmas. Let's keep it real. I think we all want gifts, right? And when I think about the gifts, gifts growing up, even now as an you know, older man, you know, when my kids or my wife buy me a gift, every time you look under the tree, you find these strange wrapped gifts that most often don't look anything like what you asked for, right? So you're like, I asked, I asked for, you know, a brand new guitar. That does not look like a guitar. You know what I'm saying? And you, you know you've done the same thing. You get that gift. You start kind of moving it, shaking it. I wonder what it is. You feel it out. Well, let me tell you something. That's what, that's what our life looks like many times. We're just trying to fill things out in our own life. Like our own life really is a mystery sometimes because there are times in our life where you look or you stop. For example, next week we're talking about vision for 2019 in the next five years of our life. And you could only imagine, you could only think about the mystery, the wonderful mystery of God of what he has planned for your life. But that mystery can only be revealed in him. As a matter of fact, let me show you a verse. Job chapter 11, verse 7 through 8 says this. Do you know how deep the mysteries of God are? And that's a good question. These are questions. Do you know how deep the mysteries of God are? Can you discover the limits of the mighty one's knowledge? And we can. He's limitless. They are higher than the heavens above. And what can you do? And so I don't know about you, but as I think about a God who is filled with mystery, he's also a God who likes to reveal himself a little bit more and more and more. And as I was thinking about and preparing for this message, I remember um, a while ago hearing this story, and it's been a minute, but the story connects with what I have to share with you tonight. And I want you to really lean in tonight because the story is a little bit long, but it's very engaging, very interesting. And I really know it's going to speak to your heart tonight. And it goes a little something like this. There was this father and son who were challenged in their relationship. And uh, this, this son was, was being challenged with, you know, how his father was constantly working hard. He was a successful businessman. He had a successful company. And so when you're that successful, then you know that it's going to demand a lot of time from you. And, and growing up, this little boy uh, saw his mother go through sickness and disease, and eventually she passed away. And the dad did his very best to raise this boy up. And, uh, but you can tell that there was a little bit of resentment in this boy as he was growing up with his dad because obviously he was a busy man. Well, the years went by and, and these, these, this father and son uh, were departing and drifting apart from each other and, and the communication line wasn't that great. Well, the kid got old enough to where he was ready to graduate high school and he was excited like most youth are. They want to run away from home and go to college out of state. And so he's thinking, man, I just can't wait to get out of here. Um, but anyways, he goes to a university. And he's thinking, you know what, man, this is my time now. And he has his first year, the second year, the third year. No, really not much communication with his dad. He's kind of feeling just odd, just weird, just a strained relationship. But on his fourth year, his last year of university, he begins to like, like draw this desire inside of him. And he starts thinking, man, you know what? My dad and I haven't really been close and I want to get close to my father. I, I, I just have this desire. So he decides to call his dad. He says, dad, you know what? Uh, for this last year, I'm going to come home every weekend. And can we just spend some time together? Can we hang out? And the dad's like, man, that'd be great. And, and so they both had hobbies. They, they, they enjoyed these exotic cars. Now, mind you, the dad was filthy rich. 
And so he had his own collection of cars. And so they pick out a weekend. He tells them, Dad, let's go to this car show and let's look at these classics. And so they're there at the, at the, at the location. And the kid literally just like stops in his de- dead in his tracks and he sees this beautiful, wonderful thing. And he says, Dad, that's the one. That's the one. As if it was a girl or something. It was a sports car. It was a classic. And he told his dad, Dad, Listen, you know that uh, I've, been, I've been getting good grades. I'm at the top of my class. I'm working hard. The only thing I ask of you for my graduation gift, please get me that convertible sports car. Can you just please give that to me? And so the dad didn't say much. And he's like, well, dad, okay, I'm just reminding you. And so throughout the year, he just kept reminding the dad, dropping hints, you know, Dad, wouldn't that nice cherry sports car convertible be sweet? And he's just dropping hints and hints. He even starts talking to his father's business partners and said, starts telling him, hey, make sure you drop some hints to my dad as well because I want that car. So his partners started telling the dad, hey, you know what? You should really get your son that car he really wants because you know what? He's, he's at the top of his class. As a matter of fact, that, that kid is so genius that he'll probably end up, you know, following your safe footsteps as a businessman and do amazing things and maybe take over the company one day. And so they kept dropping the seeds. Well, graduation day came. And top of the class, amazing grades. And after all that, they go back home to their huge mansion house and the kid is like so excited because he has this expectation. He's like, my God, that expectation of that gift under the tree, right? He's expecting this amazing classic convertible sports car and so now he's just kind of pacing around and he walks by his dad's office and his dad's like son come inside and so the son's like yes this is it this is it and he sits at the at, in front of the father's desk and the father says son uh, I'm so proud of you man I'm I just want you to know that I love you and and I believe in you and uh, I know I haven't been there much for you and it's been difficult, but I'm glad that we're mending things together and and so I have a gift for you. And he, he grabs the gift of Father and he pushes the gift across his desk and the son looks at this and he says, that's a strange package. That does not look like a sports car, right? He's thinking, a very strange package. It's wrapped weird. And so... Hiding his disappointment, hiding his anger, hiding his rage, because he was very clear with his dad. Dad, the only thing I want when I graduate is that car. And the dad had all the means to do it. And now the dad is presenting him this this strange wrapped gift. And he looks at it, and he's trying to hide the emotions. He's trying to hide the, the fear, the anger, whatever it is that he was experiencing inside. And he's just like, and so the dad says, son, open it. And so the father looks at his son, and the son starts ripping it open, and, and, and he's like, you know, kind of somewhat a little bit thrown off, kind of like, this can't be a car. And he looks inside. And the dad had wrapped a Bible with his name engraved on it, and the dad was like so excited to give him this, and the son looks at this, and he literally, he, he rejects the gift and he pushes it right to him. And he said, I didn't ask you for a book of promises. I asked you for a convertible. There you go again, Dad. You always do this in my life. It's the same thing with you. It's always the same things in my life. I could never get anything I want. Here we go again. And the father was taken back by surprise. And he said, son, at least, at least open the book at least, at least read the, 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 the words that I, I, I placed in there for you. Would you at least do that? And he said, you know what, Dad, honestly, I, I don't need that book right now. I have a whole life to live. That's not what I need right now. Maybe one day, Dad, maybe, just maybe one day, I'll, I'll pick up that book and I'll read it. But right now, no, I don't want that. And he shoved it and he rejected it and he pushed it back. And he got so upset that he went straight to his, remind you, he graduated from college. He's, he's at the top of his class. The kid's already, you know, ready to start life. He packs his stuff and he leaves his father's home. And what this son does then is that, yeah, he may have left the home. He cut out his father, didn't want to talk to him anymore. Once again, here we go, same cycle. He goes and he starts applying for 
for a job at different big corporations, but he uses his father's name to kind of wiggle his room in. And he finally gets hired. He gets hired at this big corporation, and, and this kid starts moving up the ladder, and, and now you, he's blessed, he's prospering, things are good for him. And all throughout this, he's, he's trying to prove a point. I don't need, I don't need him. I, I got my own money. I got, I got my own plans. And he's, he's living his life, and he's, he's no longer communicating with his dad. His dad calls him, and, and he doesn't pick up his phone. The dad leaves voicemails. He doesn't respond. The dad emails him, sends him letters. He literally cuts his father out. As a matter of fact, years go by, and now the son, he meets this beautiful girl, and then he, he gets engaged with her, and, and then he marries her, but never invites the dad to the wedding. Now you have this son who's married, and, and, and like two years later, he has his first child, and he does not invite the father to the, to the, to the birthing of that child. And you would think that maybe later something would change. No, a few years go by, he has a second child. And once again, he doesn't invite his father to come and partake and be a part of this whole family. Well, after the second child, and you know this, kids, if, or, or millennials, you know it. When you, when you finally have your own children, you will honestly understand the heart of a father and the heart of a mother. And something happened on, in, on the inside of him after the second child. Something happened that he, he started having this desire of wanting to reconnect with his father. Like he just felt that hole in his heart. He felt that broken place, like just longing to want to reconnect with his father. And, and so he, he, he has the, the urge to pick up the phone and he, he says, Dad, I, I miss you. I just, I, I want to see if we can reconnect, if we can talk. And now at this point, they're living in two different states. And, um, and so he'd never met the wife. He's never met his grandchildren. And, and the son says, Dad, can we, can we reunite? And the father was just like, yes. He's like, you know what we'll do? We're going to travel through all Europe. And we're going to take that time. And I'm going to get to know your wife. And I'm going to get to know my grandchildren. And they were both just excited. Well, the week that we're planning to leave on this awesome, you know, exotic vacation, the father has this massive heart attack. He has the massive heart attack, and the father ends up dying. Well, you could only imagine what the son felt like right there at that moment. He probably thought, man, this was the moment I could have reunited, reconnected. I could have gotten this relationship right. And now he's, he's once again, he's broken, and he's hurting, and, and he has to fly back home to help uh, arrange the funeral for his father and, and make arrangements for his company and everything because, you know what? He was the, the, the only child they had. He was the sole heir of all the inheritance of this, his father's company. Everything the father had was left to him. And so now the son is walking through the, the house, the mansion that he grew up in, and he's walking around, and he's reminiscing, and he's thinking, and, and he, he finally... He walks across his father's office, and, and he remembers because that was the last place that dad and I disconnected. That was the last place I met him. And he was just kind of like, should I go in, should I not? And he walks in, and as he walks in, he just begins to just feel that, that weight of pain. And, and he sees his father's desk and, and all the plans that he had, not only for his company, but for his son. There was plans for his son to take over the business, though the son disconnected. The father never forgot his son. And he sits at the father's desk, and, and as he's sitting there, he's just like, just hurting. And, 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 and at the corner of his eye, Something caught his eye on the shelf of the books, and, and it was a package, and it was the package of the gift that he had opened on his graduation day. And the son was taken back like, why, why, why is that still there? And he goes to the bookshop, and he pulls it out, and he opens it, and there it was. He was like, this is, this is the gift my dad gave me. And so he picks up the Bible. And one thing that he did not realize the first time the father gave him this gift years ago is that his father had left a bookmark in the Bible. And he left the bookmark right at Mark chapter 7. And as he opened the bookmark, if it read this. Look at this. It said, even though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And when he read that, he was just 
sobbing and crying and, and, and just reading the, 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 these verses, it was almost like immediate healing to, to his heart, just thinking about even though we are all evil at some point, he says, you know how to give good gifts to your children, but how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And so he's thinking about this, and he begins to just hold the Bible, and he hugs the Bible tight, but as he's hugging the Bible tight, guess what happens? A key falls out of the Bible. And when he grabs the key, he's now weeping and crying even stronger. And he realizes that this key is familiar to me. And then he begins to think, I, I wonder if... And so he just walks into his father's garage. Mind you, the father had all kinds of vehicles in that garage. And on the corner of that garage, he sees a vehicle that was covered with a, a car cover and it had all kinds of dust and he approaches the car and he's just like hesitating like this can't be and, and he goes ahead and he removes the car cover and it was the same convertible sports car that he had asked his father for years and years ago and all along when his father gave him that gift the golden key was in there the problem that the son had was that he thought he didn't get what he wanted, where in reality, his father gave him everything he wanted. The son did just like the way it was packaged. And so many of us have asked God for things. We have asked God for gifts, things that you have been believing God for, things that you have been praying to God for, things that you have been requesting God for. And all of a sudden, God in all his mercy and all his grace and all his kindness, love, he will give you the gift. He will give you the very thing that you asked for, but it will never be packaged the way you desired it to be. Are you here tonight? And when I thought about this, I'm thinking, you know what? There are people that are walking in at the 6 o'clock, at the 7 o'clock, at the 9 o'clock service that are in the church right now, Christians and non-Christians. Just people in general that have had things that maybe they've been praying for, believing God for, and it hasn't happened. And I, I just began to think, you know, when you think about strange gifts, let's just talk about Joseph the dreamer. Joseph, here you have Joseph. He goes and he stands before God and he says, God, use my life. God, do something with me. Raise me up. Give me your dream, God. And he's praying this because he wants to do something significant with the purpose and the plan that God had for his life. Just like you, you weren't born by accident. You have a divine purpose on this earth. And it's not just to live and breathe and eat and survive or even thrive. It's beyond that. God has something special and unique just for you. And he's packaged it so beautifully. And Joseph says, use me, God. And what does God do? He wraps up Joseph with a coat of many colors. And so he's like, yes. And that coat symbolized the favor of God, the plan of God. And God begins to show him what he would do with his life. And, 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 and Joseph starts dreaming because God gives him a picture. And he sees, okay, I, one day I'm going to be, you know, someone unique and special that will rule. And, and God was showing him that he's going to rule over a nation and that he would have power and, and that he would serve God. And he was excited. But let me tell you something. It's amazing that when God gives a gift... Not only do we not like the package it's in or we feel like it's a foreign thing, like, God, this is not what I asked you for. And all of a sudden, we know that Joseph went from being wrapped with a coat of many colors to now his brothers hate him. And you know what they do? They sell him as a slave. So now he's a slave and he's in the Potiphar's house and he's working for them as a slave. But as God promises, even in the midst of the promise, even in the midst of you walking out your call, your purpose, God will still show you signs and wonders. And Joseph started finding favor with the Potiphar. And as he was finding favor, he was being promoted as a slave. But then Potiphar's wife had the hots for Joseph. He was a good looking guy kind of like me, like a 12-pack and just buff. And, 
And, and Potiphar's wife wanted to go ahead and wanted Joseph. And Joseph said, there is no possible way. How could I do this to my God? And so now he goes from being a slave to this woman accusing him of rape because he refused to sleep with her. Now he's in jail. And he's in jail, and he meets this, these two guys, a baker and a cupbearer. And these guys, it's amazing how, how God just constantly in the middle of, of one tragedy and, and, and a disappointment and a setback, God still shows up on the scene. And, and these two guys are having these wicked dreams, and, and they're tormented and because they're wondering what's going to happen with our life. Have you ever thought about your life like, where are you going to be in the next five years? Where are you going to be in family? Where are you going to be in health? These men had these dreams. But God had a dreamer inside that jail cell. And God gave him the power to interpret dreams. And then Joseph said, well, I can, I can interpret your dreams. And, and, and the, the baker started telling him the dream. And Joseph was like, uh-oh. He's like, what? Dude, in three days, they're going to kill you. Now, mind you, the baker was wicked. He was doing some bad stuff. He, he was guilty as charged. But the cupbearer, the cupbearer starts sharing his dream, and he's explaining, like, these are the dreams I'm having. And Joseph said, hey, listen, God has revealed to me that you're going to be good. You know why? Because you were honest and you were right. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't do anything, man. You, you just got caught, and it was, it was a mistake, a misunderstanding, and you're going to be restored back to your position. And so guess what? Three days later, they come back for the cupbearer, who was the cupbearer for the pharaoh. And the cupbearer simply basically drank the wine before the king in case it was poison. And, and he's now back in position. And before the cupbearer left, he said, hey, Joseph, thank you so much, man. And Joseph said, hey, no worries. I just ask you one thing. Would you put in a good word for me, man? And the cupbearer said, dude, I got you. The cupbearer leaves and forgets him for 13 years. From a promise to a slave to a prisoner. 13 years go by and Joseph is having to keep it together and say, but I, God, but I still trust God, but I still believe God. It's not easy, but I still believe him. I still trust him. I still hold on to his promise. 13 years go by and then sure enough, perfect timing. God always shows up when all things are not working. And the king now, or not the king, the Pharaoh's having these horrendous dreams. And, and then the cupbearer's like, oh, you're having dreams? Oh, well, I, I forgot. There's this guy in the prison you've had for 13 years. Uh, he knows how to interpret dreams. And he said, bring him to me. And so they went ahead and they made him look all good again. They cleaned him up, cut his hair, shaved. I mean, the guy was just like everywhere. And he shows up and now he's in the presence of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh begins to tell him the dream. And Joseph interprets the dream. He says, Pharaoh, here's what's happening. There's a major famine that's about to hit Egypt. There will be no food. There will be chaos. There will be a, a desolation. There will be a deep depression that will hit this place. There will be no rain. There will be nothing. There will be no, nothing but Joseph said, but God gave me a strategy, Pharaoh. God gave me a strategy on how we are going to save up so that when the famine comes, people will come to us because we were prepared. And Pharaoh said, okay, if that's what you interpret it, then make it happen. And sure enough, Joseph made it happen. And now you have a, a, a guy who started with just a book of promise. He started with a promise of God to now he went to a slave from a slave he went to a prisoner from a prisoner he became the prime minister of Egypt the dream was fulfilled how did that happen well let me tell you something you have to realize that just because God gives you a gift the package may not look sweet but look at what Genesis 50 says and so when the brothers came, when their famine time came and they were hungry and people needed food, the brothers realized, oh, my God, that's my brother. That's, the, that's our brother. That's the one we sold. And they were scared for their life. But look, it says, then his brothers came and they threw themselves down in front of him, in front of Joseph. And it says, we, they said, we're your slaves. They said, but Joseph said to them, listen, don't be afraid. Do you think I'm God, man? What's wrong with you? And he says, you plan to harm me. You plan to destroy me. You plan to steal the dream from my heart. You plan to wipe me out off of this earth. But let me tell you something. But God planned it for good. What am I saying? What he's saying here, Joseph said, listen, what the enemy meant for bad, God will turn around 
for our good. I'll never forget, 23 years ago this month, Christmas, I walked into a church atheist. I said, there is no God. I was broken, hurting. I came to the end of myself, and I find myself in a church. It was about this size. I walked in, and God rocked my heart. What happened? I started desiring in my in my emptiness in my brokenness i needed something beyond what i was experiencing and i heard the gospel i heard this message this gift about jesus on christmas and as i was hearing the word i just i couldn't help but like literally feel like god's presence and it was real to me i mean i know we're all going to get presents but there's nothing greater than the presence of god there's no greater gift and I, I, I remember giving my life to Christ, and, and I kept going to church every... Man, you guys got nothing on church today. Back then, you'd go to church Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. It was like church like five days a week, you know what I'm saying? Today, you just come one day, you know, one, one, one day in the week. So it's nothing. And I showed up every time the doors opened. I walked in there. Why? I was desiring this relationship with a father I was disconnected from. I was desiring this relationship with a father that I had drifted from. And as I was there in church, I'll never forget it. It was probably like within my first year of being a Christian. I said, God, I know I'm nothing. I know I come from brokenness. I come from violence. I come from abuse. I come from poverty. I come from nothing. There is, there's nothing good about our family, God. You've seen the history of divorce, division, and brokenness. And here I am. If you can do anything with me, be careful what you ask for. Please Use my life. Take my life. Do something great with my life. And God says, okay. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I wish I could stand here today and tell you, the moment I did that, awesome things happened. And let me tell you something. Some good things did happen along the way. Some awesome things I experienced along the way. But let me tell you what came with that package that I asked for. It came with the package of my son at the point of death. It came with a package of sickness and disease. It came with a package, and when I'm talking in all the years of walking with Christ, because I've only been doing pastoring of a church eight years, so part of that, man, it was just serving God in the church, being faithful, working in ministry, helping, and let me tell you something. From, from sickness, disease, I've had moments in my life where I fell into deep depression. I've, I've had moments where in my life, and I don't care, I'm going to say, where I had suicidal thoughts. I came in moments in my life where I was abandoned, where I had people persecute me, people attack me personally. I had moments where I felt God left me. I had moments where I just felt like, God, is, this, is, this, is there really anything you're going to do with my life? There was, there was, these, there was these high moments, and I want, you, I want you to know something. So many times we think that when God gives you a gift, gift that there should never be a low tide let me tell you there's high tide and there's low tide there's mountaintops and there's valleys come on there's there's wet seasons and there's dry seasons but in all seasons here's what God says what the devil meant for harm God says I will use it for something good and I know that the Bible says in John 10 10 that the thief comes to steal kill and destroy and we could ask ourselves well how is it possible that God would allow Satan to come steal, kill, and destroy? Let me tell you what I've learned in my life. That whatever I've experienced in my life, if God allowed it, it only means that God's going to use it. God will not waste a life. God will not waste a mistake. God will not waste pain. God will not waste hurt. And I don't know where have you been in your life. Maybe you've had the pain of divorce. Maybe you've had the pain of your children walk away from God. Maybe you had the pain of family members literally just persecuting you and hurting you, people abandoning you. I don't know what your pain looks like, but let me tell you something. God's promise is faithful. His gift is true. His gift is love. His gift is hope. Sometimes God will allow things. You know why? Because he has to allow that stuff to strip us from all of that idea that I can do this without God and that my way is better and that I can handle it. I can do it alone. And God will allow some stripping in your life because when you come to that place of stripping in your life, you'll realize that Jesus has to be the centerpiece of my life and only he can bring me satisfaction and comfort again. Only the Father can. And listen... Yesterday, I went to go get a haircut. 
and I was ministering to the barber and uh, really nice guy and you know very very prestige barber yeah, I just happened to be at a certain spot got my hair cut but the guy does a lot of celebrities hairs and everything I'm not a celebrity but I just happened to land this guy's hands and it was awesome but we were sharing and I was talking to him about the Lord and he was breaking down as we were talking about God and he said you know my son my son died two years ago 18 years old I said wow Man, I'm so sorry to hear that, man. I'm sorry. And he just kept opening up. He said, yeah. He said, my son hung himself. He hung himself in the garage. And, and, and my younger son found him in the garage. And I just couldn't help but feel this compassion for this guy because what do you tell a person who has a child who died early? This father was telling me I should be the one that ha should have died my son should have been the one that was to bury me and I had to bury my son and, and you know what I just started thinking about the pain of my sister where my niece was walking on the sidewalk and these two guys committed a robbery and after they committed a robbery of a CVS store they they literally drove out of the parking lot in this 4x4 truck and they were driving like crazy trying to get away while they were trying to get away my niece who was just this innocent bystander was just walking to go to school and this truck rammed her and I'll never forget because when I when I got the call I was I was crying out to God I was praying to God and I was believing that the greatest gift would be her having life and not dying and and a minute later she died and you don't understand sometimes like why why do these packages have to come like this let me tell you something it's not that God takes life but let me tell you something but God won't waste someone's life and though it hurt, and there was grieving, and there was pain, and there was all kinds of emotions, and anger, and disappointment, and moments of like, God, why? But I had to come back to trust God, believe God, hope in God. And it was difficult because I had to arrange everything for my sister and, and help her with the funeral arrangements and, 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 and dealing with the detectives. I didn't even have a chance to mourn. Then I did the service myself and celebrated the life of my niece. My niece gave her life to Christ in this church. But let me tell you something. Since then, my sister has been healed. My sister has been restored. My sister was working in, in, in a corporation, and she got even closer to God. My, my niece's death became the, the stronghold of life for her family. And then there were so many people that she started meeting that had children that passed away. My sister became like this, this, this hand of God. And she started ministering to this parent and that parent and this parent and bringing hope. Because let me tell you something. Though in the natural you think, man, I lost my child. Like when I spoke to that man yesterday, I said, let me tell you something. I said, did he know God at all? He said, yeah. There was a moment in his life where he, he loved God. He knew God. I said, then you got nothing to worry about because we didn't lose. Your son is in glory. He's in heaven. He's with the Father, and he's safe, and he's whole, and he's healed. And let me tell you what the world would do. The world will condemn that. Aren't you glad you're not the Father? And I just think about my niece. And I think about the day that I die, I will see my niece again. And she's going to open her arms up and she's going to be like, Uncle, you were right. She called me Uncle Misha. You are right. It's awesome. See, it's not just about the gift. We make it about the gift. I want, I want, I want. It's about the process. And sometimes the process is painful. Sometimes the process is hurtful. Sometimes the process will come with depression. Sometimes the process will come with sense of loneliness and abandonment. But let me tell you something. Just like the son who was given the gift by his father, the only reason he rejected it was because he wasn't prepared for it and he didn't have the maturity for it. But there came a day when he finally received and embraced the word of God, the Bible, the life of Jesus, and he realized what he was missing all those years. And his name is Jesus. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you are a Christian. 
But do you understand that in every church in America, there are Christians sitting in services just like this right here, right now, that are empty, lonely, even thinking about suicide? They're probably thinking, you know what? My life is worth nothing. I have nothing going for me. Let me just tell you something. God would want you and I to come back to that place of just saying, I trust you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. Because I know that many of us have been rejecting the truth. You've been rejecting. You've been pushing back the promise. You've been pushing back the dream because your experience of pain has become more real than a God who is so merciful and so graceful and who has a purpose and plan for your life. But tonight, you can come back to the Father. You can reconnect again. That's the beauty of God. Romans 8 verse 28 says this. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who what? And to those who are called according to what? His purpose. You have a purpose in this life. You have a purpose. It may not be wrapped up the way you like it. But the promise remains the same. You may not like the package, but the promise remains the same. Stand to your feet. Let me release. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.